Who's had a bet with Tab for the Melbourne Cup? Yeah, most of you. Who's back the Melbourne Cup winner? One. What was it? Brew, 2000. We're going back 17 years. Well, I got off the phone on the way down here. I basically think I've got this year's winner for you. Let's face it, that's why I'm here, is to find us the Melbourne Cup winner for this year, right? Uh, I was just on the phone to a friend who's at the Werribee Training Centre, which is where all the international runners are. We'll get to that a bit, bit, bit later, but he told me, mate, there's one that's working the house down. It's around the $15 mark as well. But uh, look, we're here to tell Tab's story uh, around the Melbourne Cup uh, and just how how uh, crucial it is to our business, particularly from a digital standpoint. And uh, look, 30% of Tabcourt's turnover for the entire year occurs in a six-week period, from the start of October to the second weekend in November. And the jewel in that crown is the Melbourne Cup. And this is why. Some of the numbers, and, and it's a quintessentially Australian thing to do. I mean, our, uh, I guess our opponents would say otherwise, but uh, the numbers just tell the story. Uh, two of the big days in Australia... Each year, Melbourne Cup Day, to an extent, Anzac Day, of course, there's punting. Let's face it, we are a nation of punters, whether people like that or not, and these numbers tell the story. Uh, so, look, last year's Melbourne Cup was a record year for Tabcorp, the 2016 edition, and I think that largely reflected how uh, our digital component has really lifted its game in the last three years, because we're the only... Uh, well, we have retail exclusivity in New South Wales, Victoria, uh, the ACT and on course. So I think Tabcourt's relied or, or probably been a bit complacent around ha that retail exclusivity for a long time. And a decade ago, all our uh, opponents, uh, European bookmakers in particular, flooded the Australian market and just pinched market share. But as of about three years ago, Tabcourt started investing heavily in digital, realising that we had to claw some of this market share back and we're essentially back at the top along with Sportsbet. Uh, but we'll just have a look at some of these numbers on this next slide. So here we go. So last year's Melbourne Cup, that's the turnover. $94.5 million on the race itself. Melbourne Cup day, over the whole day, Tabcorp has well, had $141 million in turnover last year. Now, the migration to digital is in that uh, middle percentage at the top there. 41% of bets now placed on our digital channels. And uh, that's a remarkably increased from, say, four or five years ago. And that's exactly what we want to see. Uh, now... Tab accounts opened on Melbourne Cup Day last year, 43,500. That was up from 35,000 the year before. And uh, look, it's the one day of the year where you've really got to capitalise on potentially getting new customers. And then the, the key after that is keeping them active. But uh, that's what a 20, 25% increase on the year before. Turnover was up 11% and revenue was up nearly 13%. So look, that was a record day for Tabcorp and we want to break that, uh, uh, that mark again this year as well. And it's great. Two years ago, I think it was, I was down uh, in the marquee at Flemington, doing it tough, of course, uh, and uh, I looked around, and you can see how, you know, the execs and some of the big uh, power figures in the company really live and breathe it. I think we were standing a Japanese horse called Fame Games, lose about five and a half million dollars, which uh, in betting parlance is a huge lay uh, in a race like that, and you could just see their relief when it was nowhere near first. I think it was when Michelle Payne rode the 100 to 1 winner, Prince of Penzance. But uh, that's what it means to everyone at this time of year. So, uh, look, having a look at our next slide, and uh, this really, uh, I guess, reinforces the digital component. And uh, look, 5 million transactions on the Melbourne Cup itself, 11.2 million across the whole day. And you can see some of those statistics there in uh, our reaction time. Uh, across digital channels. One in four uh, betting activity was via the Tab app, and that's exactly what we want now. And that's the key one, the top left, and it's a huge, huge credit to our digital team. All our opponents, Crown Bet, Sports Bet, William Hill, Ladbrokes, they crashed on Melbourne Cup Day at some point last year. We didn't. That's nope. a bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, to so talk a bit more. In fact, our next slide just reinforces a bit more of uh, what we've already talked about. The accounts opening, the peak requests, 1. million a second. That's probably what in the last half an hour before the Melbourne Cup itself. But to talk more about this, our Operations Support Manager for Sky Racing and Digital, Rebecca Ball. Great, thank you. That was a, uh, a very, very good introduction, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll just give you guys a, a little bit of a snapshot, I guess, of what we do um, from a, a digital perspective, I guess, to get ready for Spring Racing Carnival. 
Um, as highlighted, it's an important time of year for us. Um, it's really heavily focused on as well. Um, there's a lot of preparation work that goes into it. We probably start planning months ahead um, on, on what we're going to do, what we need to deliver to the customer, how we need to set up our environment, how we need to increase our AWS environment. Um, generally, just for Melbourne Cup, we increase it up to over 300%, which is it's quite, um, quite a dramatic change. Um, my operations team is 24 by 7. Um, they're kind of the, the, the front, front line for supporting tab.com.au. Um, and this time of year is, is quite obviously busy for us. Um, in order to get everything right for us, we had to make sure that we had our monitoring down pat. We had to have alerts that were real time. We had to identify our issues before our customers told us that we had an issue. Um, that was probably something that was really, really important to us, identifying first. Um, and then letting our customers know that we knew there was a problem and we're looking into it. Um, so in order to, I guess, do that, um, we spent a lot of time, um, I guess, changing our monitoring, doing what works for us, uh, I guess, getting the result that we need to get. Um, our monitoring is real time. We get alerts via Ops Genie, uh, which is great. Um, 24 by 7, so if there's an issue in production, my team is straight on it. Generally, their response time is within a minute, which is great. Thumbs up. Good work, team. Um, but to give you a little bit more, um, I guess, in-depth of our, our monitoring and, and what we've built, I'm um, going to hand over to our tech lead, Cav, um, who's the creator of it all. Thank you. OK, so I am conscious that we should be all having beers right now, so <laughs> I'll try and smash through this. Um, let me look in. Okay, so um, Watchdog is a tool that I developed uh, in-house, and it basically does a, a bunch of stuff in the operations realm. And it's probably thanks to New Relic that it started, and New Relic also gave me a good excuse to start a React Redux node project, so thank you. Um, so as we started to grow, we started to take on ownership of other products and services, as well as guiding other teams. So that created um, a whole new set of requirements for us. So we wanted to see the health of multiple products, which were in separate New Relic sub-accounts, and map in a whole bunch of other external data sources into the same dashboard view. So we also wanted to create views that were tailored to business people, as well as technical people. So at the point in time of creating the tool, we weren't able to show inside starter from multiple sub-accounts together. So uh, one of the first views we came up that we present to the business is this uh, donut view. And basically, um, it's heavily powered by Neuralic APIs. So the outer donut is indicative of APM health, the inner donut of server health. And basically, if Anything triggers, um, for example, uh, underneath Luxbet, um, you know, the APM alert will display there. And if it's, obviously this is a load test one, so it's not that important. In Tab, we don't put our pre-stuff in that account. But basically, we get drop-down alert bars that um, I'll show in a second that will appear across um, all pages. And it will pull in the Ops Genie acknowledgement status as well, which is really cool. And um, yeah, so also please forgive me because I'm not a CSS or UX master, so I've done my best. Um, so we also integrate with uh, other data, data sources such as Google Analytics, uh, Splunk, ServiceNow, Ops Genie, like I said, um, NodePing, and then there's a whole bunch of custom tasks and scripts that we can execute and run from here. Now, let me flick to uh, another board. No, I'll 
start this one up. So basically, I had created this board prior to health map becoming a thing. But what we do with this as well, um, so basically it's like health map, but tailored to what we'd like to see. Um, and for example, for our container management and discovery, we also use console. So um, using this view that's basically powered by a bunch of New Relic API routes, we also map in the console data and uh, display it alongside our New Relic data. So we've left uh, two containers that have died just because we killed them, um, for the example. And we can easily quickly see the dead containers alongside our uh, info stack as well, which is really handy. Um, let me see what next. Um, yeah, so this one, I guess most of our technical people are on this board where all our business people are on the donuts board. And yeah, so likewise, all the Neuralic APM health stuff, like everything is in tab right now, like this is live production stuff, is pretty green. But if we were to have any um, you know, thresholds trigger and whatnot, those same thresholds are reflected across this board. Um, and I'll flick to uh, one, more one more board that we use. And so this again is also real time prod data. And the way we kind of operate is that we kind of have this belief and focus that if an alert triggers, it should either be broken or about to break. So we don't show anything on these, these boards that we display across the office to anyone unless we know it's actually a, a problem. So when it comes spring racing carnival, we continuously go back into our New Relic thresholds. Some stuff we have to you know, um, tighten, sometimes relax because there's a bunch of people who forget their account details um, come Melbourne Cup. Um, but yeah, so this is actual real-time stuff um, that's going through tab right now and for today, which is pretty cool. Um, again, um, that status bar from before, any New Relic data thresholds get thrown into here. I had a bunch of inside sports, but I think um, there's no point in really showing some of the stuff that we do. I think Peter from Mason probably summarized the exact same reasons that we go through creating uh, dashboards. We have a bunch of external vendors and whatnot. They come back to us and go, you guys have a problem. And we go, no, you guys have a problem. And we make a dashboard up and we're like, here's a nice graph. Here you go. And yeah, we, we have the exact same cycle. We show the exact same metrics. Likewise with all the other guys with their AWS stats, we, we basically do the same things as you, you guys do in, in insights. The, only thing where we probably do a bit additional where we automate things because we're so heavily integrated with Neuralic APIs is we do have some you know, morning tasks where we send a query that's on, on cron jobs to insights, check if some figures are over X number, and if not, send, al send an alert. So we use insights in that way as well, which is, which is pretty handy. Um, and I think that probably wraps up most of it. Um, so we don't just use New Relic in the sense of you know, creating a dashboard, showing it everywhere. Uh, we try to automate and display and integrate as much as we can through our existing tool set. So you know, any ops guy, any dev guy can literally log into our tool, and you've got access to pretty much everything you need to deep dive into any kind of tool. And likewise, I'd like to thank New Relic for creating the opportunity for me to come up with a tool like this, because without New Relic, we probably wouldn't be getting our stack to such a healthy and operational state prior to Melbourne Cup. So I will pass back to Jared. Thanks, Kav. Thank you. Thanks, Kav. So nearly running out of time, so we can all get out of here, go to the EBT and put our tip on for the our bet on for the Melbourne Cup. Um, so the Cup itself, first run in 1861, Australia's most famous race. We're debating today whether it's the biggest sporting event in the country. And uh, look, you've got the AFL and the NRL Grand Finals, but nothing transcends the whole country quite like the Melbourne Cup. 
and the, the betting numbers certainly back that up. So it's a, a 3,200 metre handicap race. And there you go, uh, per punter, the average spend 850, 750, uh, 730, sorry, returned in dividends. Now I've got some, uh, I love the stat over there, in fact. I don't know who came up with that. Uh, Australians drink the equivalent of 25 swimming, swimming pools of alcohol between breakfast and dinner on Cup Day. <laughs> I'm sure that's a 50-metre pool as well. <laughs> <laughs> Might even be longer. Um, and you see Michelle Payne up there. She was the first uh, lady jockey to win the Melbourne Cup a couple of years ago. One of the great stories. But all, if you it, competing in your sweeps this year, these are some of the stats to look out for. So one favourites won in the past 10 years. That was Fiorente at $7 in 2013. The current favourites, Almand and last year's winner, and a, a horse, an overseas horse called Marmello. They're $6.50. Six six-year-olds of uh, six-year-olds, sorry, have won four of the last seven six-year-old horses. Saddlecloth numbers four and 12 are the most successful. They both have 11 wins each. Uh, now, the last mare to win it was the great Maccabi Diva. That was in 2005. She won three straight. The most successful barriers, this is one to look out for. Well, 11 is the most successful barrier. The last win out of barrier 11 was 2010, a horse called American. It has eight wins. The worst, well, if you get barrier 18 and you're off a sweep, Chuck the ticket out because no <laughs> wins from Barrier 18. Um, unbelievable in <laughs> Melbourne Cup history, no winners from Barrier 18 and there's only been one from Barrier 15. That was in 1973. So the one I was just uh, got off the phone about uh, coming down here is a horse called Thomas Hobson, trained by Willie Mullins. It's an eight-year-old gelding. It's $15 with tab.com.au. The best jockey in the world, Joe Marrera, rides in Hong Kong. He's coming out to ride it. So, and he and the trainer, they've combined for two runner-ups in the last two years. So surely they're due. It's an absolute moral. Uh, one up to 4,200 metres in a 3,200 metre race. Handles all conditions. He'll stay all day. I think he's the one. $15. I bear no responsibility for losing. <laughs> Absolutely none. Gamble responsibly. Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Cheers. Thank you, everyone.